Well, good morning and welcome to South Point Church, whether you're in person or online. Is anyone fired up to be here this morning? Hey, if you're joining us online or in person, maybe you just want to type fired up in the chat if you're here. Hey, if this happens to be your first Sunday or your first Sunday online or in person, we are so glad that you chose to be with us today. We hope to see you again. My name is Matt. I'm part of the team here at South Point Church. Hey, one of the first things I like to do as I begin the message is to answer the question that every single person here should be asking, and it's, why should today matter to me? And here's why, because today we're going to tackle something that applies to each and every single one of us, regardless of the station of our life, regardless of where we're at in life. It happens to all of us, whether we have no faith, different faith, or some faith. It literally applies to all of us. And it's something called, and we're going to put it up on the screen, called family. Everyone's got family. Raise your hand if you have family. See, every, like, listen, if you're online, just type in family. Everyone has family. Listen, it doesn't matter whether you're young or old, you have family. It doesn't matter whether you're married or single. You have family. It doesn't matter whether you're divorced or remarried or in any painful situation. We all have family. You can be rich or poor, educated or non-educated. It doesn't matter. All of us have family. And here's what's crazy about family is you don't get to pick them. You're stuck with them. Right? And, and don't, don't, don't hit your spouse while you're next to him right now, right? Don't do that, right? Like, listen, we all have family. And here's the truth that you know, and here's a truth that I know that makes why today in this series matters so deeply to each and every single one of us, regardless of where we're at, both in life or in faith. And it's this truth we're going to put up right here. It's hard to win at life when we lose with our family. I mean, you know this. And I know this, and we know this. You can be doing really good at your job, but if you're losing in your marriage, well, you're not really winning. You can have all the money in the bank account you want, but if you have a busted and broken relationship and you're losing with your children, you know this, and I know this. It's hard to win at life when you're losing with your family. Christmas time comes around, or Thanksgiving and you don't get to go see your family or there's family that doesn't come see you because of a fracture or a broken relationship. Listen, we all know the truth today. It applies to every single one of us. It's hard to win at life when we lose with our family. And that's why we're kicking off this brand new series. And we're going to put it on the screen. It's this, My Family Circus. There's no such thing as normal. Can we just get like, like you know that, I know that. Like, like, listen, my family's a circus, your family's a circus. And listen, there isn't anything called normal anywhere in family. We all have our own unique families. And so over the next several weeks, we're going to talk about the relationship rules and how every relationship relationship has rules. And then we're going to talk about the mirror check. Listen, you know this and I know this. We can't, we can't manipulate and force people to do things. They have to choose to do it. Forgiveness. It is the oil that keeps friction from causing us to fracture. Listen, we need to learn how to fight fair. Listen, whether you're married or you have kids or whether you have other relationships, listen, no one is going to agree on everything. Boundaries. We all know people who don't follow boundaries. We need to be able to love our family, but also have self-care. And lastly is hurt and anger. It doesn't matter where you are in your family, all of us are going to experience hurt and anger. And here's the great news today. I know that you're here today because you want to win with your family. And here's the even better news is that God wants you to win with your family. Now, I want to kick off today with something that applies to all of us. Again, doesn't matter whether you showed up and you were spiritually curious or grew up with different faith or you've been going to church since you were little. Now, I think the best way to share this principle and this truth is based on a true story. And usually when I tell true stories, I want to usually tell them from like a decade ago so I don't look so bad. But I guys tell you every Sunday, whether you're online or in person, that listen, I need Jesus just as much as the next person. So the story actually happened just this past Monday, and I hope it makes you feel better about your flaws as we are all equally flawed, right? So Monday, I was working. It was a good day at work. It was a hard day at work. I got home a little bit exhausted. Um, there was some miscommunication in our family about what their plans were when I got home, so I was already a little bit frustrated when I got home, but it was a beautiful evening, so I said, I'm going to go for a walk. So I go to my daughter's room. I knock on her door. She says, yeah. So I open the door. I say, hey, uh, do you want to go on a walk with dad? It's beautiful. You've been in, inside all day on your laptop. Why don't we go for a walk? And, you know, I'd kind of suppose that because she loves dad and because dad provides for her and, you know, that she would want to go on a walk with dad. And she goes, no, nah, don't think I want to do that. 
She goes, I'm going to go for a walk later, but, but by myself. And I, I said, well, okay, like, you know, my feelings are hurt a little bit, but I just said, I get it. I understand, like, you know, you're in your 20s, and I'm an old, crusty dad. I get it. You don't want to be seen with me. Like, it's good, right? And then as I'm closing the door, getting right away, she goes, wait a second, Dad. She goes, um, I know you're going for a walk. Would you mind taking a package to the post office for me? And like, I'm about to go, like, like listen, this is going to be a great response from a pastor and a Jesus follower. You, you know what's coming. I was like, no, you don't want to go on a walk with me. I don't want to carry a mask and I don't want to definitely carry your packages. I go on a walk and then go to the post office. No way. I don't want to do that. And then I just slammed the door. Right. And so like, as I was thinking, like, listen, you know this, you're supposed to like want to hang out with dad and you'll totally understand that why I wouldn't want to take your package when you don't even want to hang out with me. But the thing is equally true for her. See, she thought, hey, dad, you're supposed to be helpful and take the package to the post office for me, right? And you'd understand that maybe today was a tough day on my online classes and that maybe I just need some time myself. So I suppose, and then said, she'll understand. And then she thought, well, you're supposed to, and he'll understand. And we walked away, not very happy. But after my walk, I realized that I was wrong. I was a moron. And so I apologized. And this is free. This is free. You don't have to do anything extra for this. Listen, if you're here and a parent and you know you're wrong and your kids know they're wrong, I mean, know you're wrong, you should just go ahead and apologize because when parents apologize, kids learn that when they get it wrong, they should say, I'm sorry. That was, that was just free. Just free. Right in, right in, right in the deal, right? Okay, and so it got me thinking, have, have you ever like supposed that your family member was supposed to do something, but you said they should understand? And so maybe when you said they should understand, that meant you were a little bit less helpful. You were a little bit less patient. You were a little bit less forgiving. You were a little bit less like compassionate. You're a little bit less graceful because their family, and they should understand, it's been a hard day. You're going through this thing or you got this other thing, but they're supposed to because they're family. And this awkward and not flattering true story of myself reveals the truth that every single family deals with. And I'm going to put it up on the screen. It's this. They're supposed to, but they should understand. And if we're really honest, right, like if they're family, right, when they're family, we say they're supposed to. If they're my family, they're supposed to love me. They're supposed to be kind to me. They're supposed to be above and beyond. They're supposed to, right? But when it comes to us back to our family, we say they should understand. Right? And so like, hey, listen, I, I, I think that you are supposed to because you're my family do this. But like when it comes to me, you should understand. And this is why there's often so much friction and fracture in families. Because this is what it looks like in everyday real life. Like we never want to say this loud, but I'm going to show you this next one. This is what it looks like, right? See, this is us over here and this is a family member. And if your spouse is here or your kids in the room, don't elbow them, okay? Right? Like if this is you, here's what you're thinking as a family member. They're supposed to give more. Why are they supposed to give more? Because they're your family, right? Like you're my family. You're my son. You're my parent. You're my uncle. You're my sibling. You're my grandpa, right? They're supposed to give more. But then we say to them, you should understand they should uh, uh, no one's trying, everyone asleep? <laughs> right? Hey, and they should understand, they should get less. And so here we are over here going, my family's supposed to give more so I can get more, but they should understand that I get less. Then you got your family over there, right? Not like now spouses, this never happened to us, right? They should understand, which means they get less and they're supposed to give more. And can you see why when you get two family members together with this expectation, there's a big old crack and there's friction because the reason of conflict is unmet expectations. And so this leads us to a problem that regardless of where you're at with Jesus and regardless of where you're at in your stage of life, it leads to a truth and a problem that every single family will face. And we're going to put it up on the screen and it's this. Every family has flawed expectations that set them up for failure. You see, when they should give me more and I get to give them less, and they expect to get more and give less. Now we have a flawed expectation of each other that causes pain. It breaks our relationship. And if we're really honest, this flawed expectation sets our families and ourselves up for dysfunction. And it's why we have so much pain in our families. Thus the title, <laughs> My Family Circus, right? And that's why we're all either watching or here today because there's no such thing as normal. And it leaves us asking 
a really important question today that we should all be asking, right? And the question that we should all be asking is, well, how do we change our expectation? And the reason I say we should change our expectation is because of a truth that you've, you've discovered, that you found this out. Listen, you really can't control people, and trying to manipulate them never works. It only creates harm. The only person that we can actually control is... Our, oh, man, the in-person crew, you guys are way better than the first service. You guys are doing great. Those of you online, maybe you want to type in ourselves, right? Because the only person that we can truly control is ourselves. We can't control the people. So the question is, how do we change our expectation from they're supposed to and they should understand, which means I get more and give less? What does that look like? And I say this on a regular basis. It's why I'm such a devoted follower of Jesus. It's why I love God, Jesus, and the Bible. You see, God knew that in every culture, in every generation, that every people group would struggle with this problem, that every family has flawed expectations that lead to failure. He knew this. And here's the amazing thing. Jesus doesn't leave you and I guessing. He makes the answer so plain and so simple that anyone who wants the answer to this problem of how to undo this would be so simple that anyone can do it. Simple, not easy. And here's what I love about God, Jesus, and the Bible is, is that God always portrays people as very real and genuine. The only perfect person to ever walk the whole planet was Jesus. I got some good news. You know, the disciples, the followers of Jesus, um, sometimes in church, maybe you grew up and they were called the apostles. I usually say, hey, it was just Jesus's crew. It was Jesus's posse. It was his kind of extended family that hung out with him. Did you know that the original disciples, the original apostles, they struggle with this very thing, same thing. They're supposed to, but they should understand. And Jesus addresses this head on because this unfair expectation led to friction. We catch this in the eyewitness account of the gospel of Matthew. We're going to put it up on the screen. It's this. When the 10 heard about this, they were indignant. Indignant means like angry, upset. When the 10 heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. You see, there were 12 disciples. If you ever went to Sunday school, right, there's 12 of them. But two of them, James and John, they were brothers, right? So what they did is, is while Jesus was away from the other 10, they went up to Jesus and said, listen, Jesus, I, we know that you're a king. We know someday you're going to set up your kingdom. And when you come back, could we be like number one and number two? Could you like put us ahead of the bus. You know, like you're supposed to, Jesus. Like we gave our lives, we're following you, you're supposed to. But the other disciples, they'll, they'll understand, right? I'm supposed to, you're supposed to, but they'll understand why we're asking this. Well, the other 10 heard about it and they were upset and mad because why should they get more and they should get less? And I love Jesus's response. Jesus says this, he called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Jesus turns and looks at the disciples because you know how life works, right? Everyone in the world, since they were little till they grew up, wants to work off the principle, how do I get more and give less? He goes, you go anywhere in the world, what doesn't matter whether it's government, doesn't matter whether it's in religiosity. He says, listen, everywhere you go, this principle of dysfunction where how do I get more and give less is how the world works. Jesus says, I get that. I'm going to call it out for exactly what it is. And this is what I love about Jesus. He's a truth teller. Then Jesus says these words. He says, not so with, oh, can we try that one more time, right? Not so with you. Jesus said, and see, this is why sometimes people are a fan of Jesus, but they really struggle to follow Jesus. Because Jesus says, listen, I get that the world system is how do I get more but give less. And Jesus says, not so with you. So if you want to be a fan, that's great. But if you want to be a follower of Jesus, Jesus says you are going to have to do something different. What is this different, Jesus? And he says, instead, instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Man, that fits American culture really great, doesn't it? You mean if I want to be great, Jesus, that means I have to go from the front of the line to the back of the line? Yup, that's exactly what Jesus says. And whoever wants to be the first of you must be a slave. Whoa, 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 Jesus. Like, that's pretty extreme. Like, whoa, 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 that's like, Jesus, why would you ever ask us to go from the front of the line to the back line? Why in the world wouldn't we try to get more and give less? And here's what I love about Jesus. Jesus never asked you and I to do something that he himself wasn't willing to do. Because Jesus didn't finish with these words. These are the words that he finished with. 
just as the Son of Man. See, Jesus uses the term the Son of Man for a specific reason. He uses the term the Son of Man because it means Messiah. It means the chosen one. It means the one who's going to come and fix everything. The one who will make the busted and broken world right. He's saying, listen, the one who created everything, the one who left heaven's glory, the Son of Man did not come to be See, no, whoa, whoa, y'all, y'all, I get it, church folk. I get it. Like, we think, listen, when I go to church, I want to be served. When I go to the world, I want to be served. I want God to serve. And Jesus flips the script, and he says, listen, listen, Jesus didn't come to be served. He came to, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Matter of fact, this idea that we would move from the front of the line to the back of the line is so important to Jesus and what it looks like to have genuine love where we choose servanthood over selfishness but not giving up our self-care. This was so important that the night before Jesus was betrayed and crucified and buried, but don't worry, on the third day, the tomb is still empty all these years, right? But Jesus thought this was so important on that last day that as they're gathered, here's what he says to them. We see this in the eyewitness account of the gospel of John. He says, but I'm giving you a new command because you should love God and you should love your neighbor as yourself. But sometimes if we're really honest, we're not really good at loving ourselves. So Jesus says, I give you a new command. You must love each other just as I have loved you. See, Jesus turns it upside down and says, listen, you don't get to love the way that you were taught. You shouldn't love the way that you feel. You should love the way that I've demonstrated, the way I've loved you, the way I've loved the world. This is the way that you love me. And if you love each other, everyone will know that you are my disciples. You see, you can know when someone moves from a fan of Jesus to a follower of Jesus because they're willing to get to the back of the bus. Matter of fact, if I was going to sum it all up, I would sum it in this phrase that Jesus is trying to say, I give more than I expect to get. Jesus, that's a lot to ask. I get it. But wasn't it a lot of Jesus to give up the comfort of heaven, to put on a human suit, to love the unlovable, to experience all the betrayal, all the abuse, the torture, and the separation of God? knowing that many would reject him, that he gave more than he would ever get because genuine love always chooses to serve over selfishness without giving up self-care. It's what I love about Jesus. Jesus was never willing to give up his relationship with God, but yet he was able to serve and love people. And I know what we're all thinking, whether you're online or, or whether you're here in person, you're like, do I really need to do that? Because, like, that's easy to say. It is easy to say amen on Sunday. But as we drive out of here, it's much harder to practice, right? Everyone just nod your head, even if you're online, right? Like, we all get this. It's easy to say on Sunday. It's hard to do Monday through Saturday. Is it really necessary to win at our family so that we can win in life? that we need to live like this. I give more than I expect to get. And Jesus' answer is so true. Jesus says, listen, did you know there's a kind of life worth living forever? There's a kind of life that death cannot defeat. And it wasn't the kind of life where I get more and you get less. The kind of life worth living forever, the kind of life that death and hell can't beat, is when we genuinely connect to our Heavenly Father and we obey and we serve Him and we say, I'm going to give more than I expect to get. And there's several truths that are so important that we're just going to briefly look at this morning that make this so important. It makes it why we should absolutely follow the teachings and the words of Jesus when he says we should love as he loved us. And here's truth number one. I'm going to put it up on the screen, and it's this. Truth, all relationships have rule. Can I just get an amen? If you're online, you just might want to type in, right? Like all, all, all relationships have rules. You know how I know this? Just if you're here in person, maybe just raise your hand. Have you ever been hurt by a family member? Raise your hand. If you're online, just say hurt, right? Like if you've ever, like listen, every single person that's been a part of a family has been hurt. And you know why you were hurt? It's because whoever hurt you broke the they broke the rules. You told them to keep it secret, and they spread it to everyone. You expected them to be kind, and they were mean. You expected them to be helpful, and they chose to ignore you. 
We all know this. You know why we're hurt in relationships? It's because someone has broken the rules of relationship. And so it doesn't matter whether you're married. It doesn't matter whether you're a parent or a kid or a grandma or grandpa or aunt or uncle, brother or sister. We know that all relationships have rules. That's why we all get hurt. And listen, I want to say something. This is so important. Right? Relationships isn't about perfection, but it is about a pattern. Because listen, we're all flawed. You can say amen. This is what we say at South Point. We don't care why you showed up. We don't care where you've been because God's more concerned about where you're going. And we don't care what's been done by you or to you because Jesus defines us by what he did on the cross. So it's not about perfection, but it is about a pattern of behavior and actions towards you. I'm going to tell on myself a true story. Uh, I, I don't know if you guys maybe have garnered this, but I love to talk. And if I'm really honest, I often love to be the center of attention. Now, my wife, who I, she and I just celebrated 27 years on Saturday. She's a saint. She deserves a medal. So my wife and I are a perfect match. And here's why my wife and I are a perfect match. is because she hates attention, and I love it. So we're great. So whenever we're out, like a group of friends or something, I like to storytell. I like to make people laugh. And some of the best ways to make people laugh or storytell is to tell stories that aren't flattering about yourself because it doesn't make anyone feel bad. You're just laughing at yourself, right? And sometimes I'll include stories that don't flatter my wife. Well, one evening we were coming back from hanging out with a group of friends. My wife said, hey, I'm not very happy. I'm like, well, what's up? What did I do? She goes, listen, do you remember when we were with everybody? She goes, yeah. You remember that story you told? And I go, yeah, that was really funny. And she goes, no, it was embarrassing. You told a story about us that was unflattering. Do not do that again. It hurts my feelings. And I went, okay, well, that makes sense. Like, I love you, sure. Huh. Uh, guess what happened the next time I was out with a group of friends? They were storytelling, and people were laughing. So what do I want to do? I just want to jump in and tell a story. And me and my brain, we were not working so well, so I tell a story about my family that included her that was unflattering. So we get in the car, and you know what? Have you ever, like all the married people, do not elbow, right? Have you ever been in the car? You know something wrong, right? Like, you don't even need to ask. Is something wrong? No. <laughs> Babe, we good? What's up? Just silence. I'm like, I'm in trouble. Yup. What did I ask you the last time we went out? Not to tell stories that were unflattering. What did you do? I told stories that were unflattering. And I had like, all relationships have, and when you break the rules, you create friction and you fracture the relationship. And if we're really honest, one of the reasons that we're willing to break the rules of relationship is because we want to get more and give less. Which leads to truth number two. Family doesn't excuse, it escalates. Now, from our vantage point, right, from our personal vantage point, as you're sitting there, you go, my spouse should understand. My kids should understand. My parents should understand. My brother, my sister should understand. My aunt or uncle, they should understand. But you know this, and I know this. When it's them, we always go, but they're supposed to. And here's the reality about being a part of family, is being a part of the family does not lower the bar. Being a part of the family raises the bar. You know this. You expect your family to treat you better than they would treat strangers. And your family expects you to treat them better than you would strangers. Listen, being a part of a family in a marriage and as parents and with your, with your siblings, it doesn't excuse it escalates. True story. This, this one did happen some decades ago. And I don't know for some of the, you that are watching online or here, like maybe you're not a follower and you've had those aha moments where like sometimes I think God, even if you don't call him God, gives you this idea, this picture where you go, oh, that's not working the way that I hoped. Um, in church world, when God speaks to us and we have an aha moment, the, the word that we use is conviction, right? And so one day I was going through the day, I had a lot of things to do, a lot of errands to do. And I love people. That's why I'm a pastor. I just genuinely care about people and I like talking to people. So I was out running my errands, doing my things. And I was like, hey, and they're like, hi. I was like, hey, and I'm doing great. Like, just going around, giving people compliments. But the day got and kind of got busy. The day got wearisome. I kind of just ended up at home just exhausted. And I didn't do what I should do every day before I walked through the door is take a second to go, I am walking into my family. So I walk in. I didn't take that second to go, hey, I'm going to go be before my family. I was tired. I was exhausted. I was frustrated. You know, you ever have that thing where you get kicked? And so what do you do? You kick the dog and you kick your family when you get back in. So I was frustrated. And 
not tired, so I passed that frustration and anger on to my wife and to my kids, and it was just a miserable evening, and I'm getting ready to go to bed, and all of a sudden, as I sit there, God goes, can I ask you a question? I said, no. Like, I already know the answer ain't going to be good when God says, hey, can I ask you a question, right? And so I said, but you know what? When God says, hey, can I ask you a question? He goes, you know, hey, did you treat people that you didn't even know well today? And I go, yeah. I was really nice to people I didn't know. Well, how did you treat your family when you walked through the door? And this is true of me, and I bet it's true of every single one of us. Sometimes we will treat people that we don't even know. We'll treat coworkers. We'll treat people in stores and online better than we treat our family. And God said, why did your strangers get the best version of you and your family get the worst version? And I was like, "Woo, man, I don't want to answer any more questions, God. (laughs) Don't want to do that. But isn't it true that so many times that at our jobs, at the gym, at the stores, we give our best version to strangers and we come home exhausted. And you know who gets the worst version of us? Our families. And here's the thing. We think being a part of a family will excuse our poor behavior and they get to get the worst version. But that is a lie. That's not actually how family works. How family really works is it actually escalates it. The family should be the place that gets the best version of us. Which leads to the third truth and why we're even gathered here today. And it's this. Jesus flips the script. You see, Jesus didn't just talk a good game. Jesus walked the walk. And Jesus showed us that genuine love, if you genuinely love someone, genuine love would always choose to serve over selfishness, but without giving up self-care. We're going to talk about boundaries later. But that's what I love about Jesus. Jesus comes and says, not so with you. If you're going to move from a fan to a follower, then you're willing to get out of the front of the line and get to the back of the line and bring the best version of you where you don't expect to get. You expect to give more than you'll get. And that we willingly choose that because we love our family. And that love isn't a feeling or an emotion. It is a choice that we make way before we ever have to make decisions. When I was about 16 and a half, almost 17, I was homeless. I didn't have a place to live. Got kicked out of my foster home. My adopted mom and dad took me in, and they were amazing. They're my family. I love them. Um, but they had set some ground rules. They were kind of like, hey, you know, we love you. We're gonna, we're, it's going to cost us money and time. I mean, my, my parents already had four kids, right? Like, it was already a little bit crazy in their household, right? But they took me anyway at great cost. They loved me. They showed me what it looked like, right? But I was a knucklehead. They had set some boundaries, and I decided I didn't like those boundaries. I was going to do what I wanted to do. And my dad sat me down. And he says, listen, you're about to make a choice, and you think that choice is good, but I can tell you from experience the choice that you make is only going to bring you pain. Stop it. And I said, hey, listen, I'm 17. I know what I'm doing. Got any old people in the house? We know what we're talking about, right? I thought I knew everything. It's funny. When you're 17, 18, you know everything. And then when you get to be my age, you go, oh, I don't know anything. Right? And so I ended up leaving and breaking my adopted mom and dad's heart and hurting them. And my adopted dad and mom were absolutely right. I failed at what it is I was doing. It was busted. It was broken. It was a horrible choice. And they took me back in. Listen, they didn't have to take me back in. I wasn't legally adopted. They just chose to love me because I was a busted and broken person. They did what Jesus says. They weren't fans. They were followers. They chose to serve and not be selfish. But when I moved back in, they gave me amazing boundaries. And they said, this is what it means to be a part of our family. We can love you with a servant's heart and choose that over selfishness, but without giving up self care. And if I was going to sum up the kickoff of this message today, it would be this right here. Jesus flips the flawed family expectation that they're supposed to, which means I get more, and they should understand they get less. Jesus flips the script and says, when you're a follower and more than a fan, then I'm here to benefit you before me. I willingly in love move out of first place and am willing to to go to last place, because that's what love does. 
I want to close with a true story. I used to work for an organization called Young Life. Young Life is a kind of a very broad organization. It works with high school and middle school students all over the world. And the idea is instead of waiting for middle school or high schoolers to like show up at church, um, people become missionaries and they go like coach at schools. They become substitute teachers. And then kids are always asking you, hey, you're old. Why are you hanging out with us? And you go, because there's a God who made you, a God who loves you, and a God who wants to be your friend. And I used to be a part of a training year, and this was several decades ago. And there was a legend in Young Life. His name was Chuck Reinhold. And he had this one-liner that he used during a training session that I think sums up what Jesus is trying to say when it comes to this flawed family expectation. Chuck Reinhold was teaching us that when you go to a high school campus or a middle school campus, it's, it's unnerving when you're older, to show up in their world and, and be in their environment and treat them right. And he says, many times when we show up to places, we go, hey, here I am, look at me. And he says, that's not what Jesus did. Jesus didn't show up to say, here I am. Jesus showed up and said, there you are. Imagine that if in our families, whether it's with our siblings or our spouse or our children or our grandparents or our aunts or uncles, that when we showed up in that space, they didn't get the least of us. They got the best of us. And instead of saying, here we are, we said, there you are. What does this look like? I mean, we're going to walk out of here today, and when you finish online, you're going to shut the laptop or turn the TV off or put the phone down. I want to give some practical suggestions. Maybe for some of you, it's just calling an aunt or uncle that you haven't spoken to just to say, hey, how's your life going? How how have you been dealing with all the craziness I'm having? Maybe just call an aunt or uncle you haven't talked to. Maybe if you're here and you're an adult and you haven't talked to a brother or sister or maybe a grandparent, a grandma or granddad, maybe you could take them out to lunch or do a Zoom call, whatever you feel comfortable. Maybe this week, one practical action step you could take would be to hang out with them. If you're here and you're married, maybe you could do a practical deed, like a practical action that you know makes your spouse like, that meets a spouse's need. They don't like this thing. They don't want to do that thing. But you do it for them because you know and say, I see you. I move to the back of the line. If you're here and a parent, maybe it looks like taking off the iWatch, turning off your phone and TV and laptop and giving your child 20 minutes of uninterrupted FaceTime because of a truth that we all know. It's really hard to win at life when we're losing our family. And because families all have this flawed expectation that they're supposed to and they should understand, leads to dysfunction and fracture. Jesus tells us to love like he did so that we can win in our families so that we can win at life. Let me pray. God, thank you that you never ask us to do something that you're not willing to do. God, thank you for showing us what genuine love actually looks like. God, that you left the comfort and convenience and glory of heaven. And Jesus, you put on a human suit and you showed up and you experienced all the bustedness and all the brokenness, the abandonment and torture and death and the separation of God. Not to get something from us, but to give so that we might experience life. And when we move from a fan to a follower, we follow your words. Not so with you that we would choose to move out of first place and put ourselves in the back of the bus and to say, I choose to benefit you before I benefit me. May we not just know the words of Jesus. May we not just hear the words of Jesus. May we be doers of the words of Jesus. And thank you that you chose us and that you came not to be served, but to serve us so that we could experience life and the bustedness and brokenness could be fixed. This is our hope and our prayer. In Jesus' name, and all who agreed said, amen.